Coming up on this week's show, how to find the hidden Easter eggs in the new retro gaming stamps. A cringeworthy retro moment on University Challenge. And we talk collecting consoles, interviews and game reviews with Gamer Gil Gebs 24. This week's show is brought to you by Harry's and Beer 52, the world's most popular craft beer discovery. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 211, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And may I be the first to say, happy Valentine's Day, boys. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I already feel like I'm squirming in my seat. <laughs> He's rom- always got something on that soundboard. <laughs> Most romantic day of the year and here I am. So we're two sweaty blokes talking about old video games. There's always. nowhere else I'd rather be, though. Now, of course, every week on the Retro Hour podcast, we talk about the stories that have been happening in the world of retro gaming, and we bring you a special guest. Now, this week, we're going to be joined by someone who's actually quite local to us. I mean, we record the show in Nottingham, in the East Midlands of England, and this lady's only about... 10, 15 miles away, Gebs24. She's based in Derby. Now, we've seen her at a lot of local events around here, including that big Tomb Raider panel that you went to um, a couple of months ago as well, because she's well into a Tomb Raider and classic games. Yeah, so um, this was at Derby Quad. It was called the Rest Festival, and she did a talk there, and I actually found it really interesting because she's got some really cool videos on her channel. Like, she's talked to, let let me try not butcher this name, uh, Masayuki (laughs) Amara. Uh, who, Close enough. <laughs> who's basically the creator of the NAS and yeah. Famicom. So, you know, that's absolutely amazing talking to one of these Japanese designers. She's also talked to the owner of the Nintendo PlayStation. She does great reviews on her channel as well, Juicy Game Reviews. So she does a lot of articles, a lot of written stuff, but also goes around doing great stuff like the £5 challenge. So how many games can you get for a fiver? where to find the bargains, and she's got some good tips and uh, stuff about streaming as well on this interview. Yeah, it's really good, actually, the tips she gives about, because, I mean, you'll hear the interview when it comes up, but often we struggle, like, in everyday life, going Mm. into, like, high street shops and getting good deals, and she's actually got a few tips that I didn't know about, ways to get, actually, good bargains from charity shops and actually find something more than a copy of FIFA 2008 in charity shops. Oh, really? So you'll hear about that in the interview coming up very soon. Uh, The Gebs 24, Gamer Girl, going to be joining us on the show in around 20 minutes from now. Now, some good stories we need to talk about this week as well, including some exciting Spectrum Next news that we'll mention in just a minute. Now, I am loving the fact that we are well into February now. That does mean that dry January is a distant memory. And I'm going to say two magic words to you now. I already see your eyes lighting up over the other side of the table. I think I know what it is. It might be because it's Valentine's Day. but (laughs) Free beer. Free beer. Music to my ears. How does that? Is there two better words than free beer? No, there isn't. (laughs) Now, this is thanks to our very good friends at Beer 52. Now, they are the world's most popular craft beer discovery club and what they do is they search out incredible exclusive small batch craft beers from the world's greatest breweries and bring them back to their members now we'd like to give you a free case of beer 52 all you have to do is head to beer52.com forward slash retro now we did actually a little bit of a, a party last month actually with uh, neil from retro man cave uh, he came over to your house we're all there and we actually got through a case of beer 52 that night and i think it was really good for a party environment because there was like something for all of us in there yeah, and you can kind of explore different flavours because yeah. I like IPAs and they're really popular at the moment and there's loads of different types here. So, you know, I was having the Cloudy Juicy IPA, which was really nice and there's some kind of very hoppy stuff. There's not so hoppy, you know. It's it's good. A lot of choices there. And Joe would like a, a milkshake. Yeah, <laughs> I really enjoy and find interesting like the fruity ones, yeah. but there was milkshake ones as well and then there was milkshake fusion fruit ones as well. So really, really interesting beers. Now the way they do it is every month they focus on a new country or a theme and anyone that signs up will get to discover fantastic beers. At the moment they're doing the West Country Road Trip Month and I used to live in Bristol actually. It's a great area of the country for beer and they've got some amazing beers beers in there as well from Bristol, including Firebrand's Juicy New England IPA, Lost and Grounded, their Keller Pilsner and Harbour as well. And if you like darker beers, I mean, you can pick what you want and get yourself a mixed case. If you like light ones, you can just have light beers in there as well. Really easy. And also, you will get their 100-page Ferment magazine included in the box as well. Until you read this, you don't realise how interesting beer actually is. Really good read. Now, as a listener to the Retro Hour podcast, how's about this? Our little gift for you. It's Friday. Come on, it's a weekend. Have a look on this website to get your first case 
for free. All you have to do is pay £5.95 for postage and you will get eight incredible craft beers on us. You'll get Ferment Magazine and a snack included as well. Is there anything better for the weekend? Maybe some retro games to go along with that. Well, oh, that goes without saying. <laughs> Beer, snacks and video games. Absolutely. That kind of weekend. And also you'll get next day shipping included as well. It really is a no-brainer. There's no commitment as well. Take the free case if you want. Try the beer, see what you think. If it's not for you, pause and cancel at any time. So all you have to do to get them, claim it right now on this website. And of course, you'll be helping out the podcast by doing it. Beer52.com forward slash retro and claim your free case today. Now, the Spectrum Next has obviously been a really hyped product in the retro gaming scene for a couple of years now. And I've played with various different stages of the next right's development, like in a play expo and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think we've kind of seen it in every form. Yeah. So we've <laughs> probably seen the, the original dev kit board in just a case. We've seen it in the new case, mm. but without the latest keyboard. Uh, I think Jim Bagley had some crazy portable one as well. I think Jim Bagley's always got a next on him. Well, now, now it's actually been delivered. Mm. Uh, so backers are starting to get their next. I've started to see pictures on Twitter yep. of next setups coming out with the nice box and everything. And it looks like a really cool product. Um, I'm happy it's come out. You know, three years we've kind of been waiting for this, but they had to get it right. Yeah. And the way that they've done it is they've released a couple of titles already on launch, which is really good because, you know, sometimes these systems come out and... There's not even the operating system yeah. on there. <laughs> what can or, I do with it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, you can run Linux <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. But this one, they've, they've got Baggers in Space, which is a kind of Jim Bagley based platformer, which looks amazing. Another one where I'm going to completely butcher the name Tyrion. Right. Yeah. And uh, Warhawk as well. So those games are available for pre order. And, and this that- is really great to see, you know, the actual hardware coming out. It's. Uh, it's been ages. I think there's been a lot of people waiting, but I, I'm glad to see them delivered, and I can't wait to see the in-depth videos and the kind of reviews coming out. So, guys, if you're backers, let us know and kind of post your opinions on uh, using it so far. So I think the success of it probably surprised them. I mean, they had, like, I'm looking here, 3,113 Kickstarter backers. Yeah. So, I mean, that is a lot of systems to get out, isn't it, in the first run of the Kickstarter and I know every time we talk to Jim, I see him at shows like, is it going to be a second run? Because I think when, it, when that Kickstarter came out, I thought, you know, maybe it might be a bit of interest in it, but I can get one easy enough, you know, after a couple of months when they're out. But now they do seem like, you know, rocking horse doo-doo. It's like everyone wants to get hold of them all of a sudden. But also they've, they've, they've got a new kind of announcement, uh, which is really interesting. Jim Bagley was talking about it, and it's uh, using a Raspberry Pi yeah. Zero on the Spectrum Neck. So you can actually use the SD card port uh, to have your tape images on right, okay, yeah, yeah. on the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero and then access it through the Raspberry Pi. I think that's really cool, using cheap existing technology. It's yeah. a good way of doing it, actually, because I know the BBC Micro scene, they often do quite a lot of stuff using um, B- um, Raspberry Pis as well. That's the thing, like you said, you can pick up those machines for like, the boards are like, what, for a Zero is about 19 quid or something, so it's always going to be a lot cheaper than trying to make your own, so it's a great little plug-in solution. Good to see the Nexa finally getting out there. I still do desperately want one, so... Uh... Yeah, same here. I think they were going to do a second run. Right. Uh, they were talking about it. They're doing some polling at the moment, I think, to basically check if there's the demand there for the second run. Okay, You've got, you got two votes sure here. There's lots of people that do want it, yeah. <laughs> Now, have you got a hold of the Retro Gaming Stamps? I know you uh, sent me a little picture the morning they arrived. Now, if people, we did talk about this on the show a couple of months ago, but here in the UK, Royal Mail, um, our national post office, have actually released some stamps, limited edition stamps, dedicated to retro video games that were made in the UK. Yeah, and it was uh, in association with Supple Studios and Bitmap Books as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So, anyone got them? Yeah, yeah, I've, I, I got about four copies, actually. I've been sending them. I've got a friend, Adam, in America who, who wanted a copy, sent them out. I've, I've saved a few. Joe's looking at me like, give me one of those copies. I am. Now. I remember <laughs> him telling me when he got them. I was over at his house, and he's like, I've ordered four of them. Yeah. And I was like, oh, bloody hell, I bet he has kind can of Can you thing. walk in the post office and get them, or have you got to order them? Uh, I, I think you can walk in and still get them at the moment, but right. I, I think it's going to be a limited time period. Like, I was actually in my post office recently and had a little... They'd taken one out of the book and stuck it on the windscreen. So, you know, yeah, okay. to show that it was available. That's cool. Now, obviously, they're amazing anyway. What kind of games? We've got Lemmings on there. Um, obviously, Sensible Tomb Raider, soccer. Sensible soccer. load of, like, you know, homegrown Elite, brief games. you know. Um, Micro but, Machines. <laughs> yeah, which I did, was really impressed by because I love Micro Machines. But there has been 
a couple of Easter eggs found on these stamps. Yeah, we mentioned on the show that there was going to be some Easter eggs. And we I did, kind actually, of, yeah. I, I thought that everybody had, you know, uh, found them already. But uh, this is really cool and a real innovative kind of Easter egg. What they've done is they've hidden UV ink on there. Right. So you can get a UV light and put it over the stamps. And basically, phrases will come out. So you've got goal on Sensible Soccer. Oh, no, on Lemmings. Wow. You know, it's really cool. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder how these were discovered. I just get this image yeah. of some guy doing doing retro brighting, you know, and then he had the stamps. I was going to say, I felt like it might. Be, I couldn't. I wouldn't have been surprised if it was Ravi who discovered yeah. it, like just some random black light. Like you know, it's going to be a guy in like an eighties bedroom with a black light that's yeah, kind yeah. of totally retro. You know? One of those ones that makes your teeth glow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. Though. I mean, I think the fact that they brought out these stamps is like a, a tribute to the incredible games that have come out of this country over you know the last few decades. But the fact that they've even hidden these eggs in there as well makes and, me want to and, and it's showing that it's mainstream, you know. It's yeah. got mainstream appeal now. now. Let's talk about other things that are quintessentially British. University Challenge. Yeah, so this, this was posted by Lord Arse um, th- this week and it it's a bit painful. So <laughs> the item they're talking about in question, because you're not going to see this on the radio, no. is the Commodore 64. Right. But uh, let's hear how these... Uh, Young academics answer. Young intellectuals actually answer. Right, here you go. It's going to make you feel very old. Right, you're going to take another picture around now. For your picture starter, you'll see a picture showing a model of a computer. The 10 points simply give me its name and number designation. Darren Bland. ZX80. Uh, no. Anyone like to buzz from Jesus? Jesus Cashman. Uh, um, Macintosh 83. Uh, that is a Commodore 64. It's a of course. Paxman even looks pained. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're even annoyed, Paxman. I was expecting it to be worse than that. I was expecting it to be like Nintendo 64 or something To like be fair, that. Joe would have probably got it wrong. Apple, well. yeah, Apple might... 83, though. What's that? Yeah, yeah, no idea. I mean, I know what a Commodore 64 yeah, yeah. is, but I... And if you... I might have struggled like looking at it, but <laughs> but I mean to be fair, the Vic Twenty and the Commodore Sixteen look the same. So, yeah. But then, yeah. but, but then that's the world's well was the world's yeah. biggest selling computer. You know, you'd yeah. think that uh... you got to think these guys are probably born in like the year two thousand. Yeah, and stuff, which is just going to like make you feel so old. But yeah, yeah. To be fair, someone showed you a gadget from the sixties or something. So what's this? Yeah, you'd probably. Get yeah, maybe over. if your heads heads in books all yeah. the time, then you're not going to realise. Yeah, so um, that that has been all over. Twitter it it just pained well. me though to hear yeah. that. But then I mean. You say that the Commodore 64 Mini's been shops and stuff now. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. true. Actually, been all yeah. Over, so yeah, disgraceful. Shouldn't know better. I, expect I, do, more. I just want one of those Macintosh 85s, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's really, free. You know what's really funny. I didn't see the video then, and I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. And you, you know when we were talking about the Commodore 64, you've just reminded me about the Commodore 64 Mini, and I know exactly what it looks like. When they were talking about it, I was picturing a sewing machine for some <laughs> reason in my head. I was just like, "What am I thinking of right now?" Might, might and I know exactly what one looks like. <laughs> Fair Commodore did make some random stuff. Yeah, I saw some Commodore filing cabinets at the uh, computer yeah, museum. I, I actually, <laughs> yeah, I saw that online. Some guy was like, how much can I get for this? Yeah. It was a filing cabinet with a Commodore label. <laughs> and people are like, mm, it's a filing cabinet. So if you do want to watch the clip, yeah, Lord Ars posted it on, uh, on Twitter, but I'll put a link in our show notes along with everything else that we talk about in the show this week. Now, we love playing retro games. All the time, every what, night. What about playing four retro games at the same time? What? One on each hand and then one on each foot, maybe. One on each screen. Yeah. One on each s- screen. One on each corner of the screen. One on each corner of the screen. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a game that's uh, out on iOS. Okay. So it's uh, an iPhone game. Playing four retro games at the same time might break your brain. Ooh. <laughs> now, is that the music for it that Ravi's yeah. playing on his laptop? Yeah, no, that's over me. There? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it now. I don't even know how you're playing music <laughs> off, off that computer over there. It's magic. There <laughs> so describe what you're seeing in this video. Um... I'm seeing somebody play Pong and mute the video. It's like each Sorry. corner, each corner there's a screen yeah. and basically you're going around with the cursor and you're, you're going into each game and kind of playing them all at the same time. But it seems like a mad, a mad mass management so playing, kind of exercise. He's got Pong going on and then he's got like a version of Frogger, a version of Paperboy and you've got to like jump between the games. Yeah. So these kind of games are like the games where you just have to do like a button press. So, like in Paperboy, it will just keep going, and then you just have to go back to it and turn left or right slightly. But while that's happening, you've got Pong on the other side, and you've got to move it up or down, kind of thing. That's really cool. And it's like a Mike Tyson's punch out one. Yeah, but then the games randomize as well when you finish them. I'm bad enough for Paperboy 
concentrating all my attention yeah. on it, let alone try to play three other games at the same time. It's an interesting concept as well, though. Um, and apparently, you know, you can actually unlock other games. There's 30 the apparently do, yeah. on there, so that's, that's really cool. It reminds me like WarioWare or one of these kind of Nintendo yeah. party games, you know, yeah. but... Um, uh, did you ever play NES Remix, which was yeah, one, yeah, yeah, one yeah. where you could play the older NES levels? Yeah, I love the fact as well that it's kind of it, it's tributes to older games, but they're not actually the. That's what I'm confused about. Cause it comes up and it says Paperboy, but, but they're they not the real like, games, no, no, are yeah. they? But yeah. they use the names, which is quite interesting. But mm. for a quick, you know, that is something quite novel because I'm not that massively into phone games. But I think if I was sitting on a train for like half an hour, that would probably it could keep you entertained, you know, yeah, or give me a panic attack. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, if you want to get hold of that, of course, I'll put a link in the show notes as well. Now, the London Science Museum, do you remember last year they had this really big event on um, that we talked about in the show, actually, Power Up? Yeah. And that was where they essentially filled this massive area of the Science Museum with a load of classic video game consoles and arcades and computers. Turned out it was such a big success, they're actually bringing it back again this Easter. Yeah, so it's running for like the whole month as well or something, isn't it? Yeah, 4th to the 19th of April. 4th to the 19th, so about two weeks. But literally, they've got PS4 and Xbox One, but then it goes all the way back to like the early 80s and they're kind of like... Everything in between as well. They've got GameCube, Super Nintendo, Sega Dreamcast and stuff like that. They've even got the BBC Micro on there as well, which I think is really cool. And some uh, Sinclair stuff as well, I think. So that's really interesting. And it's really great to see that like video games are just being kind of like accepted as such a huge part of like our culture and in science as well as, yeah. you know, like through entertainment and stuff. Have you ever been there? It's a giant building like yeah. uh, I, absolutely I, huge I went in like 2001 so I imagine it's changed a lot since then I went probably late I think by 2009 I went and okay. I remember then they had, I don't know if it's still there they had this great machine that you'd walk into it was like a obviously an exhibition but you'd walk in it was kind of like a big wall yeah. with like it kind of like LEDs on it yeah. and you went inside and they randomised to form letters and text and stuff and it was just sort of phrases that were flying around mm. and there's a speech synthesizer and it was speaking them as well it turned out it was just scraping random phrases from tweets. Oh, really? So these were wow. real-time wow. tweets that it was pulling in and just putting them up. It, it wasn't censored at all either. <laughs> that little kid's looking some rather x ray stuff popping up. But well, they, I thought well, it was they, really cool. They had this, when I went in there, it was like Halo. They right. had this giant ring in the middle of it and this was like, you know, four stories yeah, high. Yeah. And then they had LEDs firing around that and they'd meet up and hit each other and it just looked amazing. A great place, the science museum. Well, when I went, I was about 11 years old mm. and they had, I was there with my friend uh, we were just left there because his dad lived in London, so he left us there for the day. <laughs> good luck, and kids. Good luck, kids. Uh, of simpler times. And I remember there was this giant black screen that like took a flash image of you and then it imprinted your shadow onto the wall. Oh, wow. And we just stuck our fingers up naturally. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> and then just got our image like sl- sl- slapped on the wall. You'd still do that today. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Rude shadow puppets. So hopefully it's not changed too much. But yeah, <laughs> awesome that it's got it's 180 video games. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. that's, that's a lot more than that last year yeah um, it's usually free to go in as well i don't know if this exhibition is but there, no the charge it's not too much though i think it's about it's nine pounds on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's reasonable yeah i mean we'll, we'll, we'll link up the website if you want to book them as well um but what i love as well i mean there's actually a few pictures of last year's event here too and the fact they've got all the different systems like you can see here there's like an atari st there's a spectrum next to it a commodore 64c but they've also got like um big posters above it with the information about the machine the mm. year it came out, a bit about the specs and stuff too. So, I mean, obviously, it's a museum. It's going to be educational as well as fun. You're going to learn stuff about these systems too. But I think these are a good introduction to maybe younger people who, you know, the kids who are on University Challenge might do well to, uh, to go yeah. along and learn a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but a good little introduction to kind of the history of computing and gaming as well. So um, the tickets are available now, and that's going to be on in April from April the 4th to the 19th at the London Science Museum. Now, before we get into our retro picks this week, and um, the things that we've been doing, the things that we've been playing this week, let's give another big thank you to a big supporter of the Retro Hour podcast. Now, there is a difference between um, me and you two guys over there. Facial hair central at that side, clean shaven over here, baby smooth. I used to be clean shaven, but I looked about 20, so... As do I. <laughs> <laughs> to grow a beard, yeah. I just can't bring myself to be clean shaven. Since being like married and everything I've just developed like a triple chin so you got to keep the beard going <laughs> well that's the thing whether you've got facial hair or not you need to groom you need to keep it neat and tidy 
even you, Joe. Now, that's why um, this week's big supporter, Harry's, we want to say a huge thank you to them. It's suitable for everybody. And the thing about it is, they've got a really interesting story now. It's two guys, Jeff and Andy, two ordinary guys who were fed up with overpriced razors. You know, it's like often you get the supermarket, you buy one, and then the blades will cost you more. Yeah, you just end up like, you know what, I'm just going to buy a new razor because yeah, it's cheaper to get the blade than buying the blades. Huh? So they come up with a mission that they want to fix shaving. Very ambitious. And the way they did this... Because obviously they want to keep the quality high as well. They had to buy their own factory to do this. That's how they started Harry's. And the, their goal is that they want to take less profit and offer great quality products for a fair price. Now, their amazing quality blades are almost half the price of the leading five-blade brand. And we want you to start shaving with Harry's today. Now, I've actually got a few of these. I've been using it for a couple of months now. And I've got to say, I mean, I was using an electric razor before, mm. which um, I thought was all right at the time, but I, I don't realise how much of a closer shave I would get. And it kind of yeah. rips the hair out, doesn't it, electric razors? Yeah, so, you're right. It's yeah. very snaggy, the electric razors, I find. But we want to give you a trial set. Now, if you want a close, comfortable shave, you'll get a weighted ergonomic handle, a five-precision engineered blade with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade on there as well, rich lathering shave gel and a travel blade cover as well. Perfect if you're going on holiday anytime soon. So if you want to get started shaving with Harry's today, do this right now. Claim your trial set for just £3.95. And of course, you'll be helping out the Retro Hour podcast by doing this. All you've got to do is nip onto their website, harrys.com forward slash retro. So tap that into your phone, open a new browser, harrys.com forward slash retro with our good friends from Harry's. Now, some retro picks this week, then. This is where every week on the podcast we talk about things that we've been looking at in the world of retro gaming, maybe YouTube channels that we've been watching, maybe games, maybe websites. What have you seen this week, Joe? So, for once, I've not been watching speedruns, and I've not been watching Resident Evil, but something not too far away. (laughs) So, there has been a game that's caught my attention called Elissa The Awakening, which essentially is a PS1 Resident Evil-style survival horror game set in a dollhouse. Um, So, I've been watching people have been playing the demos. It came out about a week or two ago, and it just looks like the classic PS1. Like It's even got, like, clipping in the graphics and stuff like that yeah there's like hardly any anti-aliasing in it yeah so, like yeah. it's really 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 got that nice retro survival horror feel to it and it just looks like a really cool game that you can download right now for free uh, to play on your PC and apparently just because of the style of game and stuff like that it runs on like Windows XP and stuff right, like okay. that as well which is really cool the demo's about I think you can probably blast through it in about five minutes if you know what you're doing, but I've been watching people playing it for about half an hour. And essentially, you're just running around this dollhouse fighting dolls, shooting dolls, you know, with that fixed camera, <laughs> like tank controls, but they're, they're zombie-like. Well, it's really cool, um, so check it out. I'm hoping it does come to, like, you know, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One eventually, but PC right now. You've got some exciting news for BBC Micro fans this weekend. Yeah, so friend of the show, Retro Man Cave, you know, he's he's great for restoring stuff. Oh, he's like, the best at that. Yeah, it? fixing up stuff. So he's got a BBC Micro, and it, it's classic computer, that is, been cleaned up. You know, he's kind of done a bit of work on it. It's been a series he's been running recently, hasn't it? Yeah, and he's going to auction it off. On the 15th, which is tomorrow, basically, yeah. if you're listening on Friday, and all the money is going to go to the charity Mind. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah really worthwhile. Is that going to be a live stream then? It's going to be yeah, yeah, okay. he's going to do a live auction. Okay, awesome. So, I mean, I love anything to do with the BBC Micro anyway. So oh, yeah, and, and to have a nice cleaned up one, you know, yeah, a new yeah. one. Because they're really expensive now. I've actually had my eye on a BBC Micro for a while. I was looking at eBay the other night, so, you know, watching TV, got my phone out. I thought, oh, how much they'd be? So, I like 400 quid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah. I remember like two or three years ago, about 80 quid and that. Yeah. It's pretty much then I didn't get one. So. You could have just Four nicked one from school back in the days. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. You wouldn't have it. How many went in the skip at schools yeah. and that back in the late 90s? Yeah. Uh, now, this week, I've been playing with something maybe even more weird, um, an Apple Newton. Now, I did a video about the Apple Newton. For those that don't know, that was kind of like Apple's, the, the iPad of the 90s, the Apple Newton, wasn't it? And uh, it was a monumental failure. First thing that Steve Jobs cancelled when he got back to Apple. But I do remember, I mean, I talk about it in my video. I remember being a kid and going into Ryman, the stationery shop, and playing with them in there. And, like, you know, it wouldn't recognize my handwriting. And there's that really famous scene in The Simpsons where they try to write Beat Up Martin and it changes it to Eat Up Martha. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I was trying to get them I in. There was actually games on the Apple Newton. Wow. Yeah. So the other night I spent about three hours on Google trying to find games. And I came across a really good website. And there's a guy called Powell who I've actually been chatting to quite a bit on, um, on Facebook Messenger. And he runs a website called applenewton.co.uk. Really good website based in the UK. Um, and he's actually got a map on there as well that I'm now on. He added mm. me to the, uh, the worldwide users group. I'm, I'm on the, uh, but also, he's got a little section of it called the, the backup server. And essentially, 
he's got together all the software he could find for the Newton, put it on the server that you can download. Awesome. And then you can just, if you've got a serial cable, put them on your Newton. I've been playing stuff like Breakout, <laughs> like, you know, Amazing. really crazy. So I didn't even know you could do that on a Newton. So if you have got one, or there is an emulator as well you can get called Einstein if you want to run it on your PC and, uh, you know, see how bad it is at recognising your handwriting by using a mouse, as I tried the other day. So applenewton.co.uk, my retro pick this week. Now, before we get into our interview with the Gebs, let's roll out the red carpet and give a big thank you to this week's donators. Now, every week on the Retro Hour podcast, we do the Hall of Fame. Now, this, of course, is, we say it all the time, the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. And Ravi is going to tell you how you get on there. Yes, so you go to www.alltheWs.theretrohour.com and you click on Supporters, which is in the right corner. And then you have an option. You can <laughs> donate to us or you can donate to charity as well. Yeah, so you can actually. You can donate to us in any currency on PayPal and you can even set that up as recurring if you'd like to do it multiple times. And obviously everything we get goes 100% back into the running of the podcast. You'd be really helping us out by doing that. And you'll get a mention on a future episode like this week. Thank you, Stephen Quinn. Richard Tappenden. Tim Delaman and Jeremy Shaw, who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, we'd really appreciate it. You'll find that at theretrohour.com. Now, let's get some tips on collecting. Let's talk about the gaming scene here in the East Midlands. We're going to be talking about retro gaming fairs, how to get bargains at charity shops. The, stuff that you might the, the demise get. of retro gaming shops. Yeah, absolutely. With this week's special guest, The Gebs. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, the lady who's joining us this week is uh, both one of our favourite YouTubers, and also um, she doesn't just do YouTube as well. She reviews stuff, she streams, she collects. She's also interviewed some industry legends too. Let's welcome on, you'll know from YouTube, Gebs24. Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, Gemma. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. Now, before we start talking about you know, your collection and your YouTube channel and uh, people that you've met over the last few years, yeah. let's kind of, you know, you know, may have heard the show before. You know what, how we generally do it. We like to get your kind of geek credentials and find out where it all began. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your first gaming experience then? What got, first got you into it? Um, well, it was kind of back in the, I think it was about five or six, you know, kind of mid to late um, 80s. And um, I remember kind of one morning kind of going downstairs, Christmas day, you know, and there was a ZX Spectrum on the chair amidst a ton of wrapped Christmas presents. And at the time, I'm like, what, you know, what is this? Um, and it turns out I've since learned that my mum bought this from my auntie who didn't want it and she kind of wanted a quick sale and my mum picked it up for me and it literally went from there it was you know a lot of kind of horoscope skiing um it yeah it was it was then and and then since then it's I've, I've just it's just grown obviously as you guys know you you've seen the channel um and i've just been hooked ever since it's it's awesome your channel's kind of console based as well so it's interesting to find that you like had a computer as your first machine i know i know and and a lot of people kind of ask me that now like are are you into the amiga and i know ravi you're quite into the amiga and i'm like i i, I definitely prefer consoles over home computers and and handheld gaming and certainly pc gaming as well i don't know why i think it's just that whole notion of just sitting down and relaxing on the sofa or the gaming chair rather than sat up and, you know, having to prop yourself up playing the PC or kind of cross-legged with the Amiga out. So console up all the way for me, but I, I'm definitely not averse to, like, you know, whipping out the Amiga 500 or the ZX Spectrum from time to time, so... Well, I think you make a good point there as well that consoles are more plug and play. I mean, you probably have memories <laughs> of sitting down, like, loading Spectrum games from cassette tape and you could go and have your tea <laughs> while you're waiting, couldn't you? Absolutely. And then you always have that, that thing where you, you'd load up your um, skate or die on the spectrum and it'd crash and, you, oh, no, no, and it's back to square one. So, yeah, not good. <laughs> well, which um, post-spectrum titles uh, really caught your imagination as a kid? Um, to be absolutely honest with you, um, it was really just horoscope skiing. I used to play that game over and over again Um and then kind of post-Spectrum, it was really my, my stepsister got a Sega Mega Drive. I think it was Christmas, would have been 1991. And with that, there was like Altered Beast, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker and Sonic 1. And that for me, it was kind of a pinnacle moment going from the terrible sprites of horoscope skiing to then jumping up to some really nice, crisp 16-bit sound and visuals. 
And so, you know, believe it or not, as much as I prefer the SNES now, the Mega Drive was actually the first real console that, um, you know, perpetuated this gaming drive in me, I guess. So, you know, you make, you make a really interesting point about what a leap it was going from like 8-bit to 16-bit back then. So we don't really get jumps like that anymore. You know, like a new Xbox or a PlayStation comes out. And yeah, they look a bit better, you know, the higher resolution, but that going from a Spectrum to a Mega Drive, that must have felt like such a big leap. It did, it did. And even now when I think back, it's it still feels like it's quite a big jump now. And I think for me that there have been two big graphical jumps in gaming. There was that... And then I think going out of the 16-bit era into the 32-bit was also, it was absolutely mammoth. Like, you know, sitting down, seeing Resident Evil cutscenes for the first time with real actors, yeah. having just come off the back of Super Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo. It was like, I still feel that adrenaline now as I think about it. I don't think we'll ever see that again, that that kind of wow moment in, in terms of graphics. Yeah, it was such a huge kind of leap. And like each time they went into a new kind of area they added new stuff so later on it was like the fmvs and stuff you're yeah. totally right yeah <laughs> you know it's funny though the early 3d looks so janky now doesn't it but at the time it was jaw dropping absolutely <laughs> absolutely amazing well what kind of got you into doing retro videos and reviews um well at about i think it would have been about 10 years ago uh, when the iPhone first came out, so maybe a bit bit longer than 10 years ago, I was very much into the original iPhone and um, kind of like I had to do a lot of unlocking iPhones for my neighbours and things. And I, it kind of naturally navigated me towards the PC. And then I'd use a lot of YouTube videos to look at, you know, how to unlock an O2 phone to an orange phone or something like that. And when that scene kind of collapsed for me, it, I was already on YouTube because I was looking at the guides. I was looking at... Um, people's pc setups people's imac setups then it then it went to people's gaming living room setups man caves lady lounges um and then i'm like okay i like gaming let's just kind of let, let's start collecting retro again and um it was literally i think kind of like i said as the iphone scene died, died down for me I, I was already on youtube and it just it was really from youtube uh, seeing different videos, getting a thirst for it. And um, I, had a, I had a PS3 at the time, I had a Wii, I had a 360, so I was already actively gaming. So, yeah, I think it was just really from there that it just took off. It's it's mad to think as well, like, I watch so many instructional videos yeah. on YouTube now. You know, back in the days, you would have had a big manual <laughs> and you would have yeah. had to be going through <laughs> that now, but the culture's totally shifted. Uh, you just find a video and straight away you get into yeah. that uh, kind of YouTubing vibe. Yeah, it, it's brilliant. It's kind of almost like a reality TV, isn't it? When you watch somebody's game room tour, you're there, you're watching it, you're, you're kind of immersed and in their room as well. And that, that just fascinates me. And fortunately, I'm blessed to now be putting out content like that on my own channel. So, yeah, thumbs up, I guess, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you always been into gaming, though? Did you take like a break from it and kind of get back into it? How did that kind of work? Uh, definite break I think I I mean I kind of left home pretty young you know I was I, I went and did my own thing and went to university and didn't really pick up anything from probably the N64 to the PS2 I, it, it was a huge gap for me in 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 gaming and I think I kind of came back when GTA, the day GTA 3 came out, I was studying Dixons in Nottingham and I'm like, do I buy a PS2 on finance or do I just buy it outright? And I bought it outright and that was then the kind of moment for me to come back into it. Picking up that controller again, got some GTA 3, um, obviously great game GTA 3, it completely revolutionised the franchise, I think, you know, and again, it's just one of those crucial moments really, so yeah. Well, as you, as you mentioned, you were kind of looking at video games in Nottingham, and I see a lot of your video games are in Nottingham in the stores, but also you yeah. live in Derby. And I do, yes. That must be awesome, because Lara Croft is one of your kind of video game heroes, and Derby is the home of Lara, so do you go around feeling really proud <laughs> and looking at all the monuments and Lara Croft way and stuff like that? 
Absolutely, absolutely. And and to be honest, Ravi, it wasn't until I would say about eight years ago that I realised that um, Core Design were initially based in Derby. So I kind of, I do boast every now and again, like, yeah, you know, me and Lara, we were born in the same city. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, when you're kind of driving into Derby, you kind of cruise over Lara Croft Way. And it's, yeah, it's, it's gnarly. I love it. I absolutely blew my mind when I found it out, to be honest they, with you. They need a big statue in the city centre, don't they? That would be. <laughs> oh, God, can you imagine? That would be mint. That would be absolutely mint. <laughs> you know, a friend of mine didn't believe there was a road called Lara Croft Way in Derby. I said, that's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah awesome. this is real, yeah. <laughs> well, you actually, one of your videos I saw, you went to um, track down, like, the Lara Croft Mansion, didn't you? Yeah, that was a while back. Do you know, that was, that was a really sketchy video. I was filmed on a really old iPad, terrible production quality. Um, and I thought it'd be this big, big thing with a plaque outside. And I kind of got there and it was just, oh, is this it? And I'm kind of comparing images on Google as, yeah, this is it. This is the one, Ashbourne Road. Um, so it's kind of an anti-climax, but good to see. I guess, you know, if you've got somebody from North America, they can't do that easy. So it's good to be able to take that little bit of history of our history, Derby, and just kind of deliver it to the world. And it, and it keeps it alive. Lara is very much alive and um, it, Derby, mate, let's go. <laughs> Up the Rams as well. Can I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Not on this cast. No, <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. Oh, the old rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you mentioned about the plaque as well on the building. So I remember in that video, you're looking, there's apparently like a plaque on the wall like saying this is where Lara Croft was born but like I read that someone like stole it or something is it wasn't there when you looked yeah it was one of the um circle circle blue pa- blue plaques and um yeah I heard that it'd been vandalized and then removed which is a shame that's mm. why would you vandalize that I mean come on you know so yeah maybe an Xbox fan or something just <laughs> jealous <laughs> Well, another awesome thing that I found on your channel was, uh, I- I'm going to try and say this name now, which is going to be quite hard because it's a Japanese name. Uh, Masayuki Omura. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. is that close? Um, it, it is, yeah. Yeah, and it, basically an interview with the inventor of the NAS and oh. the Famicom. So I, I was wondering how you got involved with that because that's absolutely amazing. We've never managed to get any of the kind of Japanese Nintendo guys onto our podcast. Right, right. Um, yeah, Masayuki Umira, that was, I think, when I initially found out he was coming to do a talk at the National Video Game Arcade, I reached out to the owner um, and I said, would I be able to get a press pass and perhaps get in early? And uh, he kind of said, well, I'll do one better. You can interview him with Retro Gamer Magazine. This is what you can expect. This is what time we want you. And it was just like a done deal straight away. So I flew back from, I think I was working in Chesterfield at the time, and I raced back to Nottingham to get there for half five, to set up my camera, to, you know, make sure I had enough batteries and everything ready to go. And the interview, it was, I think it was about 45 minutes long. Um, lovely guy. What a, a, such a mild-mannered human being. Really nice, really engaging. And it was a great night because afterwards he sat in front of the audience and I was there and the guys from Retro Gamer magazine were there and he talked about the development of the NES and how it was implemented within the American market, which was there's quite a lot to it actually. You know, it was some really good insight. And I do believe that he's 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 back at the National Video Game uh, arcade again this 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 year. So um, I mean, I know they've moved to Sheffield now, but it'll be interesting to kind of see what that um, what that brings this year. Yeah, and that that seemed really cool as well because it it was something that I'd never seen before, which was kind of a shared interview. And uh, it was with Paul Jury, who's a good friend of the show, actually. Yeah, Uh, he's lovely. How how did you find that? Because I noticed, like, Paul's questions were very technical Mm. and yours were kind of very about the emotions and... uh, his, his kind of reaction to making the NAS and uh, his feelings at the time. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of, I, I think for me, it, it's easy. With a console like, you know, the NES, um, you can you can read a lot of technical information online and I didn't want to kind of regurgitate that in what I was delivering. I wanted to know about how he, the person that created the NES and the Super Nintendo, um, felt when, you know, when they were designing it. And I remember one specific question. I don't remember what I I asked, but I remember him laughing. And his translator said he he was... um, 
Masayuki Umera thinks that's a good question and uh, it kind of like knocked me back a little bit because to be honest I, I felt a little bit kind of eclipsed with, with the fact that I was sat with Paul and you've got Retro Gamer and they were you know lots of kind of dictaphones out and I'm just sat there with a with a, with a shotgun road mic and my camera and um, so it was good to know that we'd kind of connected that way and yeah, I think it was a really good interview. I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I love some of the questions you asked. So um, one part about, you know, you were talking about the volume of sales mm. and how kind of, you know, it's one of the biggest selling consoles in history. Yeah. Uh, and how he was just happy because, um, you know, it was a good quality product. He, he really wasn't bothered about the volume of sales. <laughs> and it was that kind of philosophy, you know, maybe with a Western company, they might have kind of been totally on the sales drive straight away you know absolutely and and that's that's what i mean he was just so kind of down to earth and and just very real about this product this you know massively influential product that he'd created and i really loved that i really really found that quite captivating so to be honest it, it, you know with with the actual interview itself i I found that when I look back on it now, I kind of took more around what he'd said about the design and how how they really tried to push it into the American market. Um, for example, you know how the NES is top loading? That, that was a specific feature that they wanted because at the time in America, obviously VHS was a big thing, movies, VHS, and most affluent households had a VHS. So, And they tended to be top loading in the 80s. So they thought if we make the NES look like a VHS, that's going to immediately appeal to the US market and uh, give us a bit of legway, really. So it was the whole kind of design and even down to the zapper, which... Um, I remember him saying in the presentation that they made the zapper purely for the American market on the assumptions that Americans like guns. <laughs> and I was blown away. It's like, wow, you, this, this is actually quite in-depth and uh, I guess well thought out. I don't know. Um, I mean, it sold well, so something certainly went right. But they, they'd gone down to the nth degree in designing that thing, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of talk of prototypes as well, and like the design got mm -hmm. changed so many times um, until they, they were satisfied with the final product. Do you often wonder what the internet would be like, you know, if uh, if they released like pictures of all those prototypes, though? Because they must be hiding in a warehouse or something somewhere. <laughs> yeah. That that's a fascinating question. I mean, it's almost like yeah, you you know, somewhere there's a file, there's a there's a computer with with all these prototypes on. Maybe there's even physical prototypes. And wow, it, it, never mind the internet. I think I would have a meltdown if one came out. <laughs> oh, that would be so so awesome. Well, well, talking of prototypes, kind of this the same period the Nintendo PlayStation was found, and I was just yeah. wondering, did you were you aware of that at the time of the interview, or was it like some Something you didn't want to ask him. Um, I think I was aware of it, but at the time there wasn't a massive amount of information out other than, hey, we found this this prototype. We didn't know if it was real or, or at least I didn't. I don't think a lot of that was going through my head during the interview with him, if I'm brutally honest. I mean, now it would be completely different. We know lots more about it. We know, um, obviously, because Ben Heck stripped it down. It works. Yeah. It's this. It's that. Um so I think now would actually be a great time to bring that up if I ever got an opportunity to interview him again. That would be definitely in my list of questions to ask him. Yeah, because I saw you also interviewed the uh, Nintendo PlayStation owner, but this was this was kind of early on. So he was very cautious about actually turning it on. <laughs> so yeah, are you, are, you, are you amazed to see the progress of it now? Because I, I hear there's even a emulator for it and there's games being developed now it's mad yeah it's 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 unbelievable um and at that time when i kind of reached out to um uh, to dan and his his his, his son it was it was just absolutely, you know, I've been in touch with him ever since. And we often talk in private and he's, I know he's selling it at the minute and he keeps tagging me on my personal Facebook. And, uh, you know, I think what's happened with that is probably one of the, one of the greatest gaming stories I think we'll ever see, because as far as we know, it's the only one. Um, he bought it in a bundle of stuff for $75. It's now auctioned over $1.2 million. It works. It, you know, like you said, there's lots of emulators out for it, lots of software being developed. It's fascinating. I, I if Honestly, if I had the money, which I don't, <laughs> I would buy it with, without doubt, without a doubt. 
So tell us about juicy game reviews. Ah, okay, okay. The websites. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I returned to YouTube in 2014, I wanted something completely new, like a fresh brand. And I said, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to get a website. Nothing overly technical. Um, a lot of YouTubers have them anyway. So it wasn't like it was this new thing for a YouTuber to have a website. But I created that in line with my YouTube channel, um, I like writing. I don't have as much time to write reviews as I would like, but when I do, I'll chuck a blog out on the website. I ask people to write for me, whether it's you know for a retro game or some current gen stuff. It's really just to cult again, just to kind of cultivate that community. Um, in fact, I put a blog up earlier, actually. You've just reminded me. Um, you know, it's just a nice way. If I'm not editing, I kind of class it as downtime just to be able to sit in bed and just MacBook out, get a review down. Um, if I'm not playing a game, I'm writing about a game. If I'm not writing about a game, I'm thinking about doing a video or I'm writing about a game. So really, it's I guess it's like a coping mechanism as well for me to just continue to immerse myself in my own little gaming bubble if that makes sense and juicy game reviews is a huge part of that what are some of your favorite articles that you've done on there then and like most popular ones um according to my analytics recently it's the, what's been most popular uh, metal jesus interview uh that comes up quite a bit in google search a lot of ps1 interview uh, sorry ps1 reviews that comes up quite a bit which is is it stuns me because there's not a lot of ps1 reviews on there i mean i don't have a um favorite blog i just think it's it's you know it's all on there it's just like a little it's like a little hub of words for me it's it's i don't really think oh that that's a really good piece or that's a really good piece and but i'm looking to do a lot more interviews i've reached out to a couple of guys in the console modding scene and um i've asked them if they want to kind of take part in some interviews so and it's good you know to perpetuate their business and it gives them a bit of promotion and uh you know hopefully signpost people to some good services well, we always like to explore different subjects in gaming, and you have quite a few really good videos on those. Um, this is my kind of favourite. Uh, video games that make you feel sick. <laughs> and uh, VR, I know, is a definite Ooh. thing with that at the moment, but do you think there's kind of more motion sickness nowadays or less? I, I remember Doom good used question. to send me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Did it? So you play Doom and you'd feel really sick? Oh, yeah, it's like 14 frames per second on a CRT, <laughs> oh. and I'd just, I'd love it, but I'd feel really ill afterwards. Yes. Um, well, I had the version one of the PSVR, and I could stomach about 10 minutes before I felt so, so sick and dizzy, and, you know, I had to kind of turn it off. But I've heard that the, 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 the PSVR kits that have come out since then have a much better, they're much more stable, there's less motion sickness. You know, people are getting a couple of hours gameplay with these things, which blows my mind considering I could last like 10 minutes. So I think the technology is developing. It's not for me, if I'm honest. It's really not for me. It kind of reminds me of when the 3DS came out. Originally, you know, you pop it on and everything was in 3D and it was amazing. And then you'd feel like you'd kind of struggle to focus and you just turn it off and play it in 2D. It was one of those things that was kind of great at the time and then just kind of fizzled out. And for me personally, that's what I see VR as. I don't see it as something that's going to last. I think in maybe five years' time, I don't think it's going to be as popular as it is now. But that's just my personal opinion, you know. Well, well Dan had the um, PlayStation VR, the original one. Still and, got it gathering dust. Yeah, and you had about five <laughs> solutions to try and make you not feel sick, which is like have a fan, yeah. uh, uh, pretend to walk. <laughs> Tra travel sickness pills. Travel go, sickness yeah, yeah. pills, yeah, yeah, all of this. Yeah, so, yeah, the travel yeah. sickness bands that you put around yeah. your wrist. People were recommending them, and I've tried them, but it just didn't It didn't feel like a relaxing gaming session for me. So I kind of sold it and put the whole VR notion to bed. <laughs> I think one of my favourite memories was watching Ravi trying the uh, the Sega Master System 3D glasses. You went oh. a bit green after that. Oh, after the about stereoscopic <laughs> one sent, sent me very uh, ill, yes. Um, oh, bless you. <laughs> Well, watching your YouTube channel, you know you have an absolutely huge gaming collection. And I was just wondering if you had any tips for people picking up stuff like uh, in real life or online these days? Uh, that's a good. I like that question. Um, I've always kind of said when you go into a charity shop 
or you go into a retro game store, always, always, always ask if there's anything in the back because a lot of what I found has come from asking that critical question is there anything in the back especially in charity shops i've had like i picked up an xbox crystal beautiful condition controller for like a tenner and wow. it, it it you know i watched the guy pat test it had i not have asked i probably would have just been looking at the multiple copies of fifa on the shelf but always ask i think that is absolutely quintessential and you've also got to establish because there's this whole thing, are you a collector, are you a gamer, or are you both? And I think I'm both. And I think when you're collecting, you deliberately buy things to fill the shelves that you think, oh, I'm never going to open that cellophane, or, you know, I'm never going to touch that game, which sounds really strange. But there's that part of me that when you when you go to buy something, are you buying it as a collector, or are you buying it as a gamer? I think you need to have your expectations set out before you go into a market, you go into a store um but i don't know maybe I, I think as i'm kind of voicing this it sounds like i'm overthinking it a bit but that's what kind of goes through my mind and that's what works for me what's kind of the best haul or bargain that you've ever picked up then have you ever got any like really good deals uh yeah 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 i um within the last six months actually i've got i think oh was it like 40 or i don't know 40 snes games or something ntsc bundle for like 450 quid i uh, picked up a beautiful panasonic 3do bundle from facebook marketplace ton of games i'm just looking at them now one two it's at least 10 games for like 300 quid got an atari jag bundle Unbox console, all games boxed, beautiful condition. Box controller, multi-tap for 300 quid. So, yeah, I think I've been quite fortunate, really. And and and, and I think as well, eBay is, is kind of tended to be a no-go for me. But Facebook Marketplace, you can find some absolute gems on there. Definitely don't overlook that. Yeah, I think you're right. eBay just seems every time you go on, it's like bite now prices that are ridiculous, right. like thousands, aren't they? But and I even tried like car boot sales and stuff. But I went to, we've got a thing called the cattle market here in Nottingham. Um, yeah. And I went there on a Saturday morning. Thing, I did actually see a Master System 2. I think they, were, they were essentially wanted to give it away, but it was in a puddle. So um, yeah, uh, I, I didn't pick it up. And you have to get up early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is that, which I, which I don't like to do at the best of times. But yeah, Facebook Marketplace, that's, that's a good, good idea to look on there. Yeah, check it out. Everybody, go. <laughs> well, there's also, I mean, video game markets and stuff too. I mean, obviously, we've got a few around here that we've met you at before. I mean, do you go to many like expos and events and that kind of thing? Yeah, I try to, especially the markets. I love kind of going there because you're getting content, I'm getting games, and it's good to meet people. I think I met you guys at the Nottingham market yeah. in October that was really cool and um, there's another one in April and there's Doncaster coming up we've just had a couple that have gone Milton Keynes and Leeds didn't get to them as I'd got you know um, plans but then there's the kind of Gamescom last year I went to Gamescom in Germany that was awesome it completely eclipses Eurogamer so I think I'm going to park Eurogamer now and continue my Gamescom experience every year um, and I'd just like to get to as many markets as possible and do the retro game stuff as well like with the tours different shops week after week after week. Well, there's a term uh, that seems to be really popular at the moment, and that's uh, man cave. But you seem to be <laughs> bringing an alternative out, which is a lady lounge. I quite like that. Did you uh, coin it yourself? Yeah, I did. The lady lounge. Yeah, I did. I, I coined it myself. Um, I wanted something that had a bit of alliteration to it, a little bit of a rhyme, something that was quite quirky. And that, that's literally what came to mind, really. So... Yeah, I'm glad you like it. So that's cool. Yeah, that's good, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about video game shops and stuff. I mean, where did you go as a kid then? Did you have any like kind of favourite places, any memories of video game shops that you used to go to? Yeah, in our local town at the time, there was a second-hand shop. Um, I've done lots of tours there. Um, John Shaw's second-hand shop, a really, really cool place. And as a youngster, we'd go in and there'd be row after row after row of Super Nintendo games playstation one games sega mega drive um still got quite a bit of stuff in now actually but not nowhere near as much as what he had when we were kids but we used to go in all the time and as kids you never have any money or at least we didn't but we trade you know we'd collect some stuff take up a, bun a bag of empty cut like just loose cartridges trade them in for like one super nintendo game it was fun and then obviously blockbuster that played a big part we used to buy a lot of games from there, rent a lot of games from there. But there wasn't actually a lot of gaming stores, which was weird as I kind of look back. It was tended to be secondhand shops that we would bounce into and maybe kind of glare through the window in Dixon's and Woolworth's and whatnot. So that was pretty much it for my gaming retail experience as a, as a young girl. 
I love the fact that your your gaming store that you went to as a kid is still there as well. I think the two I used to go to, one of them's now a cocktail bar. And oh, the, no. The other one's an estate agent. So, uh, <laughs> Mark, <laughs> mine's not. like a goth fashion shop. So. <laughs> Which one's that, Ravi? Is that uh, in Derby? Uh, it's called Tech Exchange in Nottingham. Oh. Uh, no, I think it's it. now called Helter Skelter. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Sounds like a rave shop or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? Kind of cyberpunky, yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a video that you did recently as well, which is a subject that we talk about quite a lot on this show, was a goodbye game mm. talking about the demise of kind of the retail sh- stores and uh, 40 closing as well. Um, is this really upsetting for you? It is, it is. Um, I think our generation certainly prefers physical over digital. And when I put that video out, a lot of people were obviously making points like, you know, there's always Amazon, you know, there's always the PlayStation store, the Xbox store. And and to me, like, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, the issue here is not going to be the drought of games. It's going to be the drought of shops to buy them from. And, and I, I like going into game and I like going into... Um, any store really that you know you can buy a game from pick it up take it to the till and just kind of cash out with it it's it's a good it's a good environment i enjoy it and it gives you a chance to to maybe find other titles that you weren't thinking of you know so if you go on amazon you kind of know what you want you punch it in you get your game you cash out it's done you go into game you think oh yeah you know mortal Kombat, or you know da 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 and you're picking up different things so I'm gutted, and and, I, and I'm gutted for the people that are going to lose their jobs as well. It's it's a shame, considering how booming the gaming industry is in 2020. Yeah, and you look at, like, you know, in America, I know GameStop over there have been trying things like, you know, setting up retro gaming lounge areas to try and get people through the door, and even, like, you know, CX over here and gamers. Well, I mean, they're doing, like, retro stuff in stores now as well here. Um, but I always remember being a kid and, like, you go in there and all the kids on a Saturday being there playing on the Mega Drives and the Playstations yeah. and all that. I mean, do you think there's anything that can do to kind of make them, like, enjoyable places to hang out in again? Do you think that's kind of missing now? Well, I think if you look at CEX, um, I think it, it's kind of no secret that CEX are, they're, they're booming. Uh, it's just obviously lots of retro, lots of secondhand consoles, you name it, you guys know that you can get pretty much everything tech wise at CEX. Game tend to focus just on current generation. I mean, they've even, you know, you, you can't even buy 360 or PlayStation 3 games anymore at game. They've phased it out. And I think, why? You know, th- th- this part of the gaming industry is still a big deal. And people will want to come in and trade 20 PS3 games for their latest copy of FIFA. Um, and I had a chat with one of my friends that owns at one of the st- um, retro game shop up north. And he said, there's not a massive markup on current gen games. You're literally making two or three quid. Yeah. He said, where you make your money is when somebody comes through the door with a box full of SNES games and trades it in for the latest Call of Duty. Because then, you you know, obviously you're kind of selling those stupid Nintendo games for a hell of a lot more than the markup you'd make on that Call of Duty game. So I think where game fall down is they don't do retro. They tend to just focus on the current gen stuff. Mm, but that to me is a bad, bad move. But yeah, it seems like one of those kind of moves that management would say, right, we'll get rid of all the older consoles yeah. to, to, to sell the new stuff, you know? Yes. So. Like there was a time about, you know, within the last 10 years when you could go in there and buy a Sega Saturn for like a fiver or something, like a really piddly amount of money when they were just getting rid of all the retro that they'd kind of got out of the cupboards. So. That, to me, is where they're falling down. I don't think that'll change, but who knows? It could be a complete revamp. Who, who knows? And uh, you've also done some videos on the kind of new mini consoles at the moment, and I liked your one, which was kind of an opposite to the Metal Jesus Rocks one on the uh, PlayStation yeah. as well. Um, what do you think of this kind of mini console revival at the moment? I think it's I think it's fantastic. I think it's great to bring in a brand new audience, um, like my brother, for example, who doesn't have the space I have, and he's just bought a PS1 Classic, and it's great for him just to sit down with his sons and play through some classic PS1 titles that he played when he was growing up. So I think for that purpose, it's, it's, it's awesome. For, for me, as a streamer, it's great because I've got my HDMI hook up in the back of the minis, straight into the Elgato, and I'm streaming um 
I'd love, can we just let N64 Mini, that has to be next. Like, that's on my mind a lot. <laughs> We've been saying it for like two years, it's coming. And yeah, we're like, it's coming it. next year. And then, yeah. Come on, Ocarina of Time, that'd be great. But I think it's 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 really good to bring in a brand new market of um, youngsters. And I, I'm kind of seeing more and more youngsters with their, their dads and their mums at the retro gaming market. And I'm wondering how much of the minis has had a role to play in that, you know. So it's an interesting time. I think we've got a lot of good stuff to come from the minis. So come on, N64 mini, let's let's get it. Needs to happen, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, you make a, you know, talking about then about yeah, youngsters getting into it too. Mm. I mean, you probably get the same on YouTube. I mean, I often get people on my videos who are like, you know, I'm 18, 19. I want to get into like, you know, 3DO or something, you know, like random. And yeah. how do I do it? What's the best place to start? So it is interesting that I think, you know, a lot of people are kind of looking before their time at what kind of got gaming to the stage that it is now. Right, right. And and that's like something like the 3DO, which isn't didn't sell well. It's not it's sad that it doesn't have a bigger prominence really in, in the gaming community. So when somebody's coming through and saying, Yeah, I want I want this 3DO game or I'm looking for this Atari Jag game, and I think, yes, let's go. You know, let's keep the the more obscure pockets of the retro gaming community alive. And they appeal to me as well, because I think there's often something a little bit kind of tragic about fail systems you know all these people had dreams and they thought it was going to take over the world and then there is something you know a little bit melancholy almost about those systems yeah it's yeah it's um it's a shame isn't it and I, and I was kind of speaking to somebody not so long ago that all these failed systems so to speak like the jag the 3do they're so expensive now mm. they I, I, I don't know why that is i wish somebody could kind of shed some light on why they're so ridiculously expensive but they're fun to collect for as well it's it's good to kind of hunt them down because they're, they're not easy to find they're, and then when they are there are terribly high prices so it forces you to look for cheaper cheaper bundles so yeah let's let's keep the more obscure parts of the retro gaming community <laughs> alive as well so I, mean, I, I don't know if you're the same but i often find when you know you get a system that you haven't played before like i recently got a neo geo cd and cool. not having owned one before it is like getting a new console because you know there's a yeah. whole new library of games to explore when you get them yeah and you kind of turn it on and you've never really kind of seen the graphic pop up on the screen and the music thumping out the speakers and it does feel like a brand new experience doesn't it mm. um like i've never played an amiga cd32 i really would like to get a cd32 bundle so you know that for me is is as, as exciting as going to buy like a ps4 pro for example i mean you know when you first pick up your pro is to me it's that level of excitement so yeah that's a that's a good point yeah ravi's your man for cd32 yeah i'll together. get you some contacts <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um you recently went to gamescom as well which is kind of the yeah. world's hugest largest video game show and I was wondering, was there like a lot of retro there, seeing it started to blow up again? There was, you know, Ravi. There was a massive um, retro arena. There were three main halls with all the kind of current gen stuff. And then there was this huge hall for retro. And it included things like your pinball tables as well. So, and lots of indie developers were in there and lots of art, um, kind of people that were putting out lots of retro game art. It was awesome. It was fantastic. It was great to see Retro have such a huge prominence because if you go to like say Play Expo, you get this. It's there's lots there, but I'd, I'd like to see just that little bit more. It seems like the market side of Play eclipses the kind of console, you know, sit down with your family kind of aspect of Play. But Gamescom was huge, so we'll so hopefully it'll be as big this year as well. No, we need to get out there, don't we? Every oh, year totally, we keep saying totally, we'll go. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to go, definitely. We also you stream a lot as well. I mean, we often hear people talking about the fact that streaming's kind of like the new, you know, gaming television, really. I mean, when you're doing it live, is there something extra about it from doing pre-recorded YouTube videos and is it a bit more pressure and stuff? Pressure? Um, no, I, I actually find that more therapeutic than sitting down and, you know, putting all the lights on to film a YouTube video. I think streaming, you're right, it is for me it's gonna it's it's coming up there and it's gonna be up there with some tv tv stuff i think it already is if you look at what the, the numbers that twitch pull in youtube pull in and mixer pull in combined it is it, it, it it's a strong competition for a lot of, of um mainstream television in my opinion uh, in terms of pressure 
Mm, not really. I, I kind of, it, it's anxiety provoking, but it's that really good anxiety. Like, you know, before you're about to go on holiday and you get all nervous and you get little kind of bubbles in your tummy, it gives me that. And it's a, it's a good rush. So, so long as I'm kind of getting that rush, I'll keep doing it. So the streams, I love streaming. I w- I'd love to do it full time. D- disadvantages for streaming, I think you have to balance what your audience want to watch and what you want to play. Because sometimes... I'll kind of play something and in my mind I'm not in in into the game but I'm into the stream if that makes sense so I, I love talking to my chat I love interacting I love the kind of the banter but my mind isn't in the game so that's when I know I'm kind of streaming for the audience rather than for me but what I'm trying to do at the minute is is you know I have to be comfortable in what I stream and sitting down you know because people think, oh, it's easy. You just turn on a computer and you stream and it's fine. And it's really not. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of configuring that goes on behind the scenes. It's flipping expensive to maintain as well. There's a lot of equipment. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of weird. Since I've started to stream, I've, I've just got this chronic sciatica, like absolutely excruciating pains in, in like my sciatic nerve. So sometimes I'm kind of sat there and I'm into the stream, but I'm in pain and I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to do? I need to stand up. So I'm hoping when if and when we move i'd like a separate stream set up where i can have a brand new camera with a brand new green screen and have it where i can walk away from the stream set up and we go to like a different stream um kind of different stream theme where i can stand and you know interact differently i've got loads of ideas for it i just oh streaming's great guys it's awesome yeah we did our first um live video game stream over christmas on youtube oh, what one thing okay. i find as well is like you know when you're doing it you always think oh you know are people going to judge my gameplay i felt really <laughs> sorry for our co-host joe when i thrashed him at killer instinct he was awful at it so i thought it felt really bad he's for just him. nodding his head now in disgust <laughs> <laughs> i think i think yeah you, there's always that like what if i do bad and i think if you embrace the flaws you know like sometimes the yeah, elgato will crash and some people can have a meltdown and the stream freezes and it's fine you've just got to embrace it make it fun and we do this thing where i'm like right guys i'm going to put the be right back screen on and i want everybody to spam 24 in the chat 24 24 so while they're spamming 24 the be right back screen's on i'm like freaking out behind the camera like chucking the wires and kind of fit trying to figure it out but they're having fun doing something and we come back on and we laugh about it and it, it just <laughs> it just flows you've got to embrace embrace the bad times if you lose Ah, it's fun. <laughs> so what's coming up on your YouTube channel then? So we have um, some £5 game challenges coming up, which is a hugely popular playlist by as many games as possible for £5 in CEX. we got the Doncaster Market coming up, so there's going to be some awesome content for that. Fingers crossed I have my eye on an Amiga CD32 bundle, praying it comes off, but we will see. So, you know, we can maybe kind of chuck some of that on the channel as well with a nice retro gaming haul. Lots and lots of good stuff to come. Um, you know, I'm possibly going to upgrade my camera and, you know, improve the visuals a little bit. I think where you can kind of make tweaks behind the scene to increase your product quality, you know, that's what I'm kind of aiming for in 2020. Fantastic. Well, of course, we'll put a link to your channel in uh, this week's show notes as well. Everyone should go check it out. Gemma, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining us. Likewise. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, guys. Cheers, Gemma.